Thank you. <coughs> Thank you for inviting me. And I have no conflicts to declare. And if the prize for a boring presentation, I'm going to win. I have just a few slides to show you and no fancy graphic. Um, I would say that the majority of clinical research up until now haven't found any association between exposure to anesthesia and dementia. It has been published tons of studies and they're all retrospective studies where they could have been proving any uh, association between anesthesia and dementia. But it starts to change and that's what I want to present to you. Dementia develops over many, many years, probably 10, 20, 30 years. So it's a lot of problem to design a perfect study, as you understand. And the problem is that many patients do have a mild cognitive changes before anesthesia that we are not aware of when they come to the operation room. And we consider them normal mentally. And then when we do the test afterwards, we might consider them a bit um, um, with cognitive impairment. And also the comorbidities that they are suffering from when they come to the OR can contribute to dementia. So there, it's really hard to make a good design of a study. And mild cognitive impairment is a stage of cognitive impairment between normal function and dementia. And this um, state has many names. Uh, mild cognitive impairment or post-operative uh, cognitive dis dysfunction and even other expressions for this state. But usually it's something when you follow it up, it, it's there for, uh, usually you follow it up for a week, two weeks up until three months and most of the patients do recover. It might be around 1%, I would say, that continue to be, uh, have a, to have a cognitive dysfunction, and it might develop to a permanent dementia. But I want you to know that there's a two different uh, sicknesses. It's not the same. It might be, but we don't know for sure. And this study comes from the Mayo Clinic's proceedings, and um, Jurai Sprung, who has published a lot of um, of studies on this uh, topic hasn't been able to show any positive outcome that there is a relationship. Uh, he calls this study here, it came out um, last year that he did a prospective study, but I don't agree to that because he used all, all the patients in the 70s, 90s and a very big group, uh, over 700 1,700 participants, which he evaluated when it, when it came to memory, neurological tests, and also he did um, biomarkers for a typical gene for dementia for Alzheimer's disease, APOE. But he did that afterwards, and he didn't have any basic uh, status to compare these patients. He just went back in the files to the age of when they all were 40. And you know how, what you write in the patient's files, it's not that every doctor and special not surgeons uh, are aware of the mental status of the patients. Uh, what I'm going to pres pres <laughs> present to you are the more, more um, positive when they have been able to show there is a relationship. And this study comes from China. And uh, it is a rat study. And uh, they looked at uh, how does is isoflurane cause um, Alzheimer's disease related cognitive impairment. And they, and they used age rats and that, that means the rats were older than 24 months. And they had five groups, 
six groups of, gra of rats. They had a control group that got just, um, they were, they were, uh, they were just getting oxygen, 30 percent, and then they have five groups where they got 1.5 percent of isofluorine and 30 percent oxygen, and they had anesthesia for two hours. And the rats were then tested after 12 hours, one, three, and seven days after exposure in a water maze, and they saw that uh, there was a difference between control rats and the rats that had received isoflurane. They also uh, looked for the levels of amyloid precursor protein and other related proteins to Alzheimer's disease. And the, the result was that uh, isoflurane rats had an increased escape in the water maze and impaired spatial memory and they also had increase in those biomarkers. So I would say this is a very small indication that maybe it's something in it. And we have to start. I mean, rats are not humans, although I heard a couple of years ago when somebody said rats are not humans, but some humans can be rats. <laughs> I don't know if you agree to that. But uh, we have to start with rats or cell cultures to be able to solve this problem. And also, we have to do clinical studies to follow up. But that's what's really hard to do. And this paper was published in a very good um, journal, Plus One. So I think we have to pay attention. In we have to consider these results to be interesting and um, go on from here. Another study was published in Brain Research two years ago. Uh, it comes from Stanford, and it's also a rat study. And um, they study rats in different ages, young rats, middle-aged rats, and old rats. And they were all anesthetized with isoflurane or silverflurane for three hours. And some rats were sacrificed immediately, other after 24 hours. And they did micro, very sophisticated microscopy with the scanning electron microscopes. And they did immunohistochemistry. And uh, what they saw was that the elderly rats, the age rats, the oldest group, they had a compromised uh, brain blood barrier with um, with those at those rats that had been uh, receiving silverfluorin, and to have the membrane broken means that it's much easier for proteins to come into the uh, to the brain. It could be inflammatory proteins. It could be more toxic pro uh, products from the anesthesia that we give them, and it kind of disrupts uh, uh, this wrap the blood-brain bar blood barrier and the tight junction there, and it disturbed the neural function. And what's interesting that you just saw this in older rats, because what we have seen uh, when, we repair it, when we compare it to, to humans is that the young brain, there has been many studies when they have really looked upon if kids having anesthesia early in life, if they get deficits later in life when it comes to learning uh, and uh, development of brain. We haven't, none have been able to prove that that's the case. And I think that can be explained by the young brain is very, has a very high plasticity. So if you lose some, brain, uh, some neurons, other parts of the brain can take over. And the next study is a clinical study. It also comes from China. And it's, I would say, this is the first human study, which is prospective. And it's a very small study. It's randomized, double blind, a clinical trial with 150 patients older than 60 years undergoing laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And either they get propofol, silverfluorine or isoflurane anesthesia. 
And the, the testing, the methods they're using this, that is neuropsychological tests before, after, and day one and three. They also look at the plasma levels of proteins associated to dementia, and then I'm, yeah, that's Alzheimer's disease, and proteins associated to inflammation. And as I said, they took the, all the tests and all the blood samples before anesthesia, after extubation, after one hour and 24 hours postoperatively. And the result of this study is that um, uh, postoperative cognitive dysfunction was lowest in the proper fold group. And also, the, all the markers, the biomarkers for both uh, dementia and inflammation, inflammation were lower in the proper fold group. So the advice is that uh, elderly people should, may, should maybe have proper fold if anesthetized. And this is a very well done study, worth reading. And the last study I will refer to is, comes from Karolinska, where Lars Eriksson has been the PI. And that is the immune response to the human brain to abdominal surgery. I think you mentioned it too, Mats, this study. Uh, this is uh, the thing, um, everybody knows that uh, if you have surgery, you will have an inflammation. You will have an immune response in, I would think, most of the organs, even the brain. And that, what, that is what uh, this group has been showing by using PET, uh, positron emissions tomography, with an uh, uh, immune marker radio ligand that could show that the brain changed after, after surgery. They did it before surgery and they did it after surgery. Uh, but it's a very small study, just uh, eight male patients in the age um, uh, from 60 and upwards. And the conclusion is that both PET and immune cells in the peripheral blood showed a decrease in activity during the time nearest the opera operation, the surgery, and then it normalizing in three months. Why do I take up this paper to discuss here? Because I think it's, um, it's important, because I think what causes dementia, if that's the case, which I'm convinced uh, that it does in somehow, it could be many different ways of causing it, and I think, and I think uh, neuroinflammation is one, but also that maybe that anesthesia paved for the, for the inflammatory cells to come into the brain by breaking the membrane. Could be one of the explana explanation. And unfortun unfortunately, <laughs> I will I will stop by saying I can't answer the question if anesthesia is promoting dementia. So we need much more studies. We need uh, lab studies, rat cell studies to find out the mechanism, and we also find big clinical studies to answer this question. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. I think we have time for one question or two short ones. Why didn't you <coughs> say anything about your own study? Uh, <laughs> well, I think hot topics, I think that you should uh, refer to other studies, but we just uh, completed a study that was awarded for an uh, abstract prize. And we had a poster here, number 19, where my coworkers uh, could show that the, it's also retrospective studies, which I never think is good. Studies should be prospective. But we could show that patients receiving anesthesia and uh, that they had a, a great turnout on uh, dementia. 
May I remind everybody that we have um, Sveiveckan next year in Linköping. Mm. And I, uh, I suppose that we will return to this subject. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, I, I think so. Thank you. Thank you. Well,